Good morning, everybody. You're very welcome to your latest Zoom room. My name is Kevin Fern, and I'm from Queen's University here from the Research and Enterprise Directorate, and I'm delighted to be part of the ESRC Festival of Social Science, which is running this week, along with my colleague, Lynn Gulp, who is hiding in the background under the, the name of Queen's Policy Engagement. The festival is running all of this week a number of events that are celebrating you know, the contribution of social science to, to our everyday lives. And, and this particular event is just one of 20 events that are organized by Queen's and Ulster University, and they'll finish up at the weekend. So for those events that maybe you haven't seen, you can still see information on it on Eventbrite. And we also have a YouTube channel where we have recorded the majority of the events and you can view them then afterwards. And Lynn will share the, the URL for the YouTube channel in the chat. So if you're interested, you can pick it up there. For today's event, I just wanted to give you a bit of context uh, before we start about this uh, celebration of social sciences and particularly our look today at the contribution of social sciences to the COVID pandemic. Back in March, whenever everything went into lockdown, I managed a fund at the university called the Impact Acceleration Account, which provides funding for academics to take their research to another level in terms of impact and engagement with external organisations. So as with a lot of different funds, uh, on my phone. Uh, the, the Impact Acceleration account then, we, we quickly pivoted and made a, a call available, which was the COVID Rapid Response, where we were looking for ideas from academics to use their research to actually help in the, in the situation of the pandemic. So this covered everything, and you'll see lots of examples today of some of the applications and the projects that have been up and running you know, everything from education through to, through to earnings in the music industry. So there's different things that we've supported. And the idea was that it was a quick turnaround and it was things that people could do that were beyond the kind of the medical and the science end of things, but looked at the, the wider implications of the lockdown, you know, particularly around education and mental health, which as we know are the big issues that, that came from it and are still with us today. So, so that's where the idea for the event came from. There's still a lot of activity happening, and we've also had a COVID, rapid, or sorry, COVID response uh, fund, which is kind of longer term, looking at the recovery period of uh, of what's happening from the lockdown. So there'll be more about that in due course. But for now, then I'm going to hand over to your facilitator today, Janine Ware from Innovate Communities, and she's going to lead you through this morning's event. And you'll have plenty of opportunity to engage, you know, through chat and even put your hand up if you want to ask a question. But for now, I'm just going to pass over to, to Janine and wish you all a very good event. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Um, welcome. And for those of you who haven't had a chance yet to do our quick little Menti chat, I'm just going to put it into the chat now space as well. And you'll see the link. All you have to do is literally click on that link. Um, to get a little bit interactive with us for today. Um, as Kevin said, um, we're going to work through the Zoom functions. So feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat um, space down at the bottom, which is the little speech bubble at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, please keep yourself muted um, until there's discussion or question times, and then we'll be able to work our questions into the discussions. We are recording, so if you don't want to be seen in your pajamas or fluffy slippers, et cetera, feel free. It's up to you to put your video on or off and um, just have a really interesting conversational, use the chat feature as much as you can, pop your questions in there as we go along and we'll get started. So I'm going to, first of all, share our morning check-in. So hopefully you've been able to go on for the Menti already. And as you can see already, we've got somebody who's ready to party. Every, a large percentage who are saying it's their video off morning. And then we have a few there who are very confidently Zoom ready. So keep using that Menti chat function that I've put into the chat area and um, pop an answer to the rest of the questions that we've got on there. So we're going to kick off. We have Oh, I think we've lost Janine. Two 
go. Hello, my dear. Janine, Kevin? you broke up there, but you're back now. I'm back now. Okay. So we've got two um, brilliant researchers and lecturers who are coming to us around the social media challenges of COVID-19 and public health messaging. So I want to introduce to you Dr. David Cutting and Dr. Neil Anderson. They are created in, in conjunction with the Public Health, uh, Centre for Public Health, um, looking at a social media, the dashboards of social media activity to aid decision makers in recognising concerns and hot topics within the community around the whole topic of COVID-19. So I'll hand over to David and Neil. At the end of this particular session, we will take a Q&A um, as one of them has to leave early. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I'm afraid, yes, that's me. That's me that has to uh, leave early, so it's entirely my fault. Let me just share my uh, presentation uh, with you. So hopefully you should all be able to see this in a second. There we go. I'll just move that uh, off the side here. Um, so yeah, good good morning, everyone. Afternoon, whenever the time it is, I'm a little confused. Uh, my name is Dave Cutting. I'm joined today by my colleague, Neil Anderson, and we're from the School of Electronics, Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. So we're really happy to be here because they don't normally let us out much. We tend to spend a lot of time in dark basement. And obviously we're not social scientists. So one of the things that we found um, particularly interesting of working on these projects is the fact that we've been exposed to a wide variety of different kind of impacts and, and drivers. Um, what we're going to do is just very briefly talk about some of the work that we've done um, during the COVID pandemic. So we were approached because we already had um, some existing relationships with the Centre of Public Health around what we could do to help people understand, policymakers and decision makers, understand the huge volume of data um, that they were being bombarded with. They, we live in a world where we kind of swim in data all the time. Social media is huge. Um, if you take even one strand of that, which is Twitter, there are millions and millions of people sort of typing away into the Twitter sphere um, every minute of the day and um, 24 hours a day. So, uh, David, you've muted yourself. Uh, no, I didn't. He said the host muted me. So, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I mean, maybe it was my fault. Anyway, anyway, right. If you can hear me, I'll, I'll carry on. Um, yeah. yeah. Good. Okay. In addition, there's all sorts of um, data sources around um, urban mobility and how people are moving uh, around, and also an awful lot of news media out there. And the sort of challenges we were faced with were how can we present this in an accessible, understandable way? And can we then help decision makers make informed decisions based on what public are, are talking about, what the hot button topics are? And one of the things which has been particularly of the fore in this public health emergency is the arrival of what we would call dangerous misinformation um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute but things which either are patently dangerous such as injecting bleach um, to cure COVID which is not a good idea whether you have COVID or not although it would be the least of your worries um, if you did inject bleach um, or the stuff which potentially had worrisome misinformation which if it got traction should really be challenged by reputable public health sources um, to come across so this was the kind of decision is how 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 can we help them make understand this information 20 30 40 years ago before social media um the government policymakers would read the letter pages in the local papers nowadays those letter pages are twitter and thousands and thousands of people letting their opinions come out so how can we possibly understand that so we've created a series of dashboards and this is just some of the work we've done so we focused on on twitter because it's publicly available people sort of come out and we created a twitter dashboard around covid issues for northern ireland um, and we also looked at mobility data to see about adherence to lockdown um, economic impact that my colleague neil will talk about in a minute um, and we also were producing as we went along um, community gathered reports on things like symptom tracking apps. So the NI uh, COVID checker app, the um, King's College of London Zoe app, things like that. We were in a position as, as computer scientists to be able to get that data out of the database and generally turn it into headline reports, which policymakers and decision makers can look at, um, all provided funding through this, um, this call that we've got. So I'm just going to show you a few of the examples that we got out of Twitter here. So this is, I'm going to try and pronounce this right, hydrochloxychloroquine. 
um, a drug which um, certain people seem to think was the great hope for um, COVID with absolutely no evidence whatsoever. Um, and what you can see is a bit of a, bit of a messy graph. What we're interested in really are the pink spikes, which is when a lot of people are talking about what happened. And you can see that there are distinct phases. So this was around the start of the pandemic when certain people were kind of mentioning it. We see a very distinct um, peak in May um, and again in July and in August these kind of news cycles that come out when certain individuals look at it. And we can look at other topics and terms as well uh, in terms of this. So garlic was a very interesting one because garlic was one of the um, homeopathic kind of, if you use garlic, you know, I don't think it was inject yourself with garlic. I think it was like rub it into your, your gums or something and have it in the room. Um, you will be safe from COVID. Uh, and obviously that's something we're interested in tracking just to see whether or not it was perhaps worth a public health message to say garlic is probably good for you, but it will not keep you safe from COVID. So again, we can see that, for example, there was a worrying trend around um, very, very early uh, July, but it went away. What we're looking for here are worrying trends that kind of peak and go on for a long time. Um, Remdesivir, um, how, how have you pronounced it? Again, another one of the drugs that are held up by certain people um, as being incredibly popular. And you can see here that it suddenly gained an awful lot of traction um, towards the end of June. And in fact, what happened then was that there were announcements of trials that were being halted on it, continued to go, and there was effective public health messaging by the UN and other public health bodies um, in terms of the effectiveness of it. And then um, just to kind of bring these charts to an end, this is the chart for bleach. Um, should we or should we not inject bleach into our eyeballs to cure ourselves from COVID? The answer, by the way, is definitely don't do it. Uh, certain people um, mentioning no names who are very Twitter, um, love to be on Twitter, often in capital letters, um, decided to mention it. And you can see here that this was a massive spike. So this was one of our real time, we didn't intervene on this, but we were asked immediately, look, this has come out, are people in Northern Ireland seriously talking about injecting themselves with bleach? Because if they were, then of course we should probably encourage them not to um, very, very quickly. And we were able to say, well, look, there was a huge volume of people talking about it for a very short period of time. But luckily the good people of Northern Ireland pretty quickly decided it wasn't a good idea and stopped talking about it. Um, so we were happy enough with that. And with that, that was our, our social media stuff. Um, and we also were looking at mobility. So I'll hand over to my colleague, Neil, to talk about that. I wonder, I wonder if there was any confusion over last weekend as to whether or not Four Seasons, Four Seasons Total Landscaping in Philadelphia was actually a supplier of bleach for cleaning driveways or not. But so, um, anyway, yes. Sorry about that. Um, we yes, we we did some uh, we did some work on um, uh, as Dave mentions um, social mobility as well, um, and we did this uh, right from the the very beginning of the, the pandemic. Um, so what we've got here is we've um, we're going to show you a couple of different graphs from the the different providers that we uh, that we worked with, and um, uh, so by and large we worked with uh, Facebook um, through a, an initiative that they have called um, Data for Good. And Data for Good basically gives us um, uh, at a research level access to um, the mobility data from uh, Facebook users' mobile phones. So if you have the Facebook app on your phone and you're uh, moving around the, the country or moving around the city, um, uh, when it, Facebook knows where you are. So it's based on what, what are called location-based services. And all of that data is then pushed back up to the Facebook servers and is held there. And it's used to provide you with um, search results that are um, suitable to the location you're in and that sort of stuff. Facebook will then anonymize that data and then provide it back to us as uh, researchers. So we can't find out where any individuals are. We can't identify anybody individually at all. But what we can do is we can basically find out how Facebook users are moving around cities and how they're moving around countries. Um, we did that with Facebook and we also did it with uh, Google as well. So Google provided, um, uh, openly provided their location-based data from Google Maps users. So you were able to see how um, users were moving around. Um, now they provided it um, done into uh, these sort of classification areas. So you can see here, now this is a, a very messy graph, but um, we broke these down into subgraphs as well. So you could see the, the, the charts um, individually, but I'll just go through at the top. They broke it down into retail and recreation, uh, pharmacy and grocery, parks, train stations, workplaces, residential areas. Um, and basically what it meant is that you could monitor 
how people were moving between different areas um, as the pandemic um, uh, started and worked its way through. If pink line, the pink vertical line is the, um, the UK wide lockdown, uh, which started just after the Irish lockdown. Um, so we, that was on the 23rd of March. And you can see what we have on the left hand side of the pink line is really quite close to a baseline. And the baseline was established based on the, um, the same movement patterns, but taken in February. So Facebook and Google were able to look back and say, well, in February, people were doing this. We'll establish that as a baseline. And then we'll be able to see how people do move um, whenever they are um, you know, after the pandemic. So if you take the, uh, the, the pink line and then have a look in particular, um, two of the, the most stark ones are the light blue line, which is residential. And basically what we're seeing is a massive uptick in people staying at home. And as soon as lockdown was announced, and actually it, just before lockdown was announced, there was probably for the week before, we started to see that as well. Um, and then um, sustained um, time spent at home um, whenever, um, uh, you know, during the, those sort of initial sort of 12 or 13 weeks of lockdown. And you can see to the right hand side, as we get towards the end of June, that um, residential line tails down. Another one that's very interesting to look at is the dark blue line, which is the parks line. Um, so parks and recre uh, parks and uh, areas. Now that includes places like um, um, uh, national parks. And this is a US centric um, data source initially, but it also includes places like um, parks and cities and uh, play parks and beaches as well. So basically anywhere that is not a, a commercial recreation area. So a cinema or something like that, but outdoor spaces. And you can see that basically as soon as lockdown hit on the 23rd, the uh, percentage of uh, people attending parks completely collapsed. Um, and the interesting bit was then as we got towards the end of May, we saw an uptick in that. Now there were, there were spikes and there were all sorts of things um, uh, along the way, but we, you can genuinely see the, the, um, the movement coming back uh, towards outside areas during the month of June. Now, obviously, it's easy to look at it now and say, well, that makes sense because there's lockdown and there's the summer coming. But as you can see, you know, we, uh, uh, it's nice to have an overall picture, but we were getting this data week by week. We were reporting on it week by week. And uh, so it was very much an emerging picture for us as we went. Um, I'll pop up and I'll have to look at the next one. Um, yeah, so what I've done is I've just provided these in a wee bit more detail for you, just because the, the previous graph is quite difficult to, um, to be able to see the differences. The interesting um, part for us was to be able to look at um, both a UK average, uh, a Northern Irish average, and a Republic of Ireland average as well. Um, so we basically took all the local government districts in Northern Ireland, and then we um, aggregated the data where it was where it was available, and we provided a, a straight average of those um, of that data. Um, and Republic of Ireland, you can see. Um, about a week before um, Northern Ireland had a big shift to people working from home. So you can see that red line just to the left of the, the, the pink line shot up really quickly. And we were able to track the responses of uh, public health and governments, both in the public. Am I back? Yeah, no, we can yeah, hear I'm not sure if it was me or you. But... Yeah, um, so you were able to track the response of uh, public health agencies and governments, both in the Republic and the UK and Northern Ireland simultaneously across all of these charts. Um, so that, that's what we did at this sort of level. Um, if we um, also provided, um, as Dave mentioned, we provided weekly reports um, to Department of Health and to um, uh, Centre for Public Health in, in Belfast. And I've just taken a quick snip from uh, one of these reports so you can see the sort of things that we were talking about. We're talking about um, uh, higher than baseline long distance mobility vectors. And I'm, I'm going to show you some of those on the next slide in, in a minute when, when I've talked about this. But we were able to tell the difference between people who were moving short distances, so people moving inside a town or a city, and people moving long distances, so people going up to the North Coast for the weekend, or people going to Newcastle um, for the weekend, or you know taking uh, some time over a, a bank holiday. And then what we did was we then tracked um, how all of these different networks, so Facebook at different times of day, midnight, eight o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the afternoon, and Google, which gave us direct access to public transit data. And we could map all of that data against each other. And you can see the correlation of that data where we get a drop-off, we hit lockdown, we get a significant drop-off, 
And then as time goes on, those mobility vectors, as in the number of people moving, start to climb back up towards the baseline that had been established um, in advance. And again, so this is running from um, start of March until around this start of um, July are these ones that we've taken here. And this is the sort of data that we were presenting on a sort of a Friday night basis um, to Department of Health. Um, so then we have the mobility vectors. Now, th this can be a bit overwhelming when you look at it for the first time, but um, if you take a, a really simple idea that on the far left, we've got middle of March, and on the far right, we've got the um, end of June. Okay? And now that I, I've obviously skipped out some weeks because I can't show you everything on one slide, but what I wanted to let you see was I wanted to let you see the difference in mobility over the, uh, the time. Few things in terms of interpreting these graphs, so they, they should be easy enough to interpret, is that a dark blue line means that we've got a high traffic mobility vector, and a red line means that we've got a lower than usual mobility vector. So if you take um, examples where you look at Belfast, so um, if, if you have a look at Belfast in the province, um, say around the 20th of March, which is the very top left cell, you can see traffic moving backwards and forwards between um, Derry, Enniskillen, Newry, Newcastle. We can see what we would call cross-country long-range mobility vectors. Um, and this is based on text data that Facebook sent us, and then Dave had written some scripts that basically run these um, through a GIS system that he'd built, and then uh, and map all of this for us uh, every, every Friday so we could see this. Um, the crucial part then is when you see, I, I've stepped right into the middle of lockdown, um, 17th of April, reading across the top, 24th of April, and you can see that the long range mobility has completely collapsed, especially by Sunday the 26th, which is around the center of your screen. You can see that there was basically no long range mobility across Northern Ireland whatsoever. Then on the right hand side of your screen, what we start to see is coming from the start of June to the middle of June, towards the end of June, you can see those mobility vectors building up more and more and more. And you can see crucially those long range mobility vectors. And that's what we're really worried about at the start is that if you have a, a COVID cluster in somewhere like Belfast or um, which, which, which obviously was a, an area that did, um, that what you don't want to do is, is accidentally transmit that COVID cluster to Coleraine or to Newry or to Enniskillen um, just by uh, you know, um, buses and cars moving. So that was one of the, the other things we looked at um, at that point. I think that's everything we have on that, Dave. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So if anyone wants to some insight. Yeah, it's a very small list. Um, we did a lot of other stuff. We've got a whole load of online resources. Here are our content details um, if you'd like to follow up with us. Thank you, David and Neil. That's brilliant. Does anybody in the Zoom room now have questions um, before they have to leave? Feel free to either unmute yourself or pop it in the chat. And just while we're waiting, um, David and Neil, was there anything like really strange or startling that came from this particular research that you thought, I never expected that? Well, there was a couple of things with the Twitter data that were interesting, which was that we really did expect people to jump on the bandwagons um, of the, the sort of crazy loud man on Twitter in caps lock shouting. Um, we, we really were, it's, it's, it's strange thinking back on it now because lockdown was a different time for us, you know, and it's strange looking back on it in retrospect, but at the time, everything was quite worrying and we, we really did expect that people would start not necessarily as we joke about injecting themselves in the eyeball with bleach, but not far off it. We expected that message to be much more um, transmittable we, uh, than, it, than it actually was. And it was, uh, it was incredibly reassuring actually to see it collapsing every time um, David would run one of those keywords through the system. We would see it absolutely collapse again two days later. Um, that, that was particularly interesting. And um, the other thing that really interested us and I, we weren't able to show it in those screenshots because um, we did some UK wide and UK and Ireland mobility as well was the the complete collapse in transit outside of Northern Ireland and um, Northern Ireland became you can joke about this I guess you know, but Northern Ireland became very insular and um, during that lockdown period um, and I think what we were surprised about was the the speed of response um, from individuals um, in the you know, the compliance with lockdown um, at that part in March. 
So those are two things that stood out for me. Yeah, I think just one of the things I, I thought was very was was quite interesting is when we started looking at Twitter data, we'd never really looked at it before. We had this idea about doing a thing called sentiment analysis, which is that you feed the you feed tweets into a, you know, a machine and it comes back and says, is it positive or negative? Um, one of the things we discovered very quickly is that it, no no system in the world, no matter how clever it's built by Google, uh, understands Northern Ireland's sense of humour. Um, so it, it turns out that basically a lot of a lot of Northern Ireland Twitter breaks the yeah, <laughs> the language models. Um, so that's interesting research for for future. That's great. Thank you very much. And it just goes to show we actually behaviour wise, I suppose, conformed with a lot of the requirements and the requests during that period yeah. as, a, as a wider society. Absolutely. And I mean, Northern Ireland, I would say, because obviously, as I say, Neil, Neil mentioned, we did look at some of the wider UK data. I've also spoken, been speaking to colleagues at um, other universities on the mainland who have been mapping English places. Uh, Northern Ireland was by far and away one of one of the best devolved nations in terms of adherence. Um, you know, the long distance journeys fell away uh, towards the end. They began to tick up, you know, people going to Newcastle when the sun was out and things like that. But compared to the southeast of England, uh, yeah. no, no, it was it was a it was a, a great success in terms of adherence in Northern Ireland. Brilliant. Thank you, David and Neil. We're going to move now to Yanis, who is um, going to look at the performing arts and the creative industries. Um, particularly um, a project that was um, compiled between performing artists in Greece and Northern Ireland, just to look at the impact of COVID-19 on working lives, creative ecologies in their sectors, and to basically explore how something that is such a people oriented space, how did that move during COVID? So, um, Dr. Yanis and Dr. Ali worked on this particular research and project. Um, and I'll leave it over to you guys to kind of develop and show us what you came up with. Thank you, Yanis. Thank you very much, uh, Janine and, and Kevin and Lynn, uh, for giving us the opportunity to say a few words about our uh, research project here. Um, so uh, it'll just be me today uh, speaking about both sides of the project. Um, but um, the, the main thing that I wanted you to start by reflecting on is um, if you were privileged and lucky enough to be able to stay at home over the lockdown and work from there, uh, you might have noticed that um, you over the, the, the period, especially that period of complete lockdown, you would have maybe consumed a lot more culture. Um, online that you would have uh, normally. So think of the, the amount of um, films and series that you binge watched or the music that you've been listening to either in the forefront or in the background. Um, even um, a lot of musicians that I know and I'm sure you know as well have been doing live online shows on their Facebook or through organizations uh, mostly for free as well. So um, what we noticed from the beginning is that even though there is this um, essential explosion of, of cultural creativity and consumption, at the same time, uh, workers, people who work in performance, don't actually um, see their salaries reflecting that explosion. So essentially what we've had since the beginning of the lockdown and the pandemic is a crisis of employment for performing artists. Now, the, the background that both me and Ali um, come from, uh, we, we both, first of all, we, we both work at Queen's. Um, Ali is in the School of uh, Arts um, and Languages, uh, and I'm in the School of um, History, Anthropology, Politics, and Philosophy. And we, we've both been researching for years now the connection between uh, performing artists and ideas of job insecurity, precarity, uh, careers and so on. And we've been both focusing on different types of crises. So my, my research was a lot on the Greek economic crisis in the past few years and how musicians dealt with that. And Alice's research has been on um, uh, theater, uh, especially theater artists um, in uh, Northern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, connection to austerity as well. So we, we both had a background in looking at artists' lives in circumstances of, of crisis, precarity and so on, and how do they make a living? How do they and so on. So it was quite a, um, 
uh, in a sense, self-explanatory move to see what is happening now with COVID, which is a kind of a, a circumstance that is bringing everybody globally uh, together into the kind of same uh, same boat um, there. Um, so um, let me first of all say a few words about um, the um, our aims in, in this research. So the, the moment that we designed this project, we were trying to do um, three things. First of all, uh, was to understand, as any researcher is, is trying to do, so understand how freelance performing artists um, are actually, sorry, um, are actually impacted by COVID-19. What kind of um, um, trouble does that mean for uh, performing artists who don't have secure jobs, whose um, gigs and engagements have been cancelled, and so on. Um, secondly, we wanted to collaborate with them. And I'm going to talk about this more in a minute when I when I talk about the methodologies. But the idea was that we're bringing those artists into the team of, of research. We share knowledge with them. We hear from them, uh, and we collectively uh, develop um, ideas, uh, feeding into their campaigns and articulating some policy proposals that hopefully are going then up to to powerholders, stakeholders, and so on. And the, so the third thing that we wanted to do was develop some of these strategies. Okay, but the, the but develop them collaboratively in a way that we're um, not just kind of listening to them and then taking away their thoughts and developing proposals away from them, but actually engaging them in, in the whole um, um, process. And hopefully by doing this to some extent comparatively between Northern Ireland and Greece and also Republic of Ireland coming in at a later stage, um, we were trying to think of strategies that might work uh, across uh, national borders. So, um, a few words about the methodology of this, this research. We, we come from an approach um, that has been called in the past few years, um, nothing about us without us. And this comes from feminist studies as well. And the whole premise around this approach is that we can't be uh, doing research or developing ideas and proposals and strategies and so on, referring to specific uh, demographics of people being workers or defined by gender, ability, sexuality, and so on, without including them um, as, as part of this, this process. Okay. Um, so what we're trying to do with this project, as I said, is identify uh, individuals and collectives in both of those contexts, in Northern Ireland and Greece, that can work with us and um, actually, as much as possible, let go of the control of this research project and give it um, to them. So to those grassroots campaign uh, campaigns, developing what we call bottom-up methods. So uh, starting from them and feeding upwards rather than a top-down approach where um, power holders or academics or what have you um, are kind of feeding, feeding down. Um, so this is where, where the, the premise of the methodology started. And in order um, to do this, we developed um, essentially four teams, two teams in Northern Ireland and two teams uh, in Greece, um, around four principal um, collaborator practitioner experts, what we call them. Um, and essentially, these people are in Northern Ireland, um, a theater maker and a playwright um, who were instrumental in starting a number of campaigns. Um, a Facebook group called um, Northern Irish um, Freelancers Surviving Corona. Uh, they put together um, a, a, what is called a bread and butter hardship fund for artists, and they developed a website that I encourage you all to, to look it up called Artists and I, that, that is giving a lot of information about what artists in Northern Ireland are dealing with at the moment with COVID, and, and also giving um, sort of um, advertising opportunities for, for funding and so on. Um, so these were the people involved in the Northern Irish team. Uh, one of the things that we started noticing is the ambiguous relationship they have with, for example, um, trade unions uh, that are active in the, in the space, um, that they had mixed maybe views towards them, but also kind of collaborating with them uh, in, in different ways. Um, what we found um, talking to these artists is that um, freelancers in that kind of space um, are excluded from most state support, and also they are excluded from the decision making around it, uh, which is um, sort of uh, interesting in that kind of sense. Okay. Um, also, uh, that the arts funding that that um, those artists are entitled to is is very limited. In Greece, which was more the, the field that I was uh, involved in, we worked specifically with musicians, which is the the kind of field that I have more connections with. 
um, and also with this um, grassroots movement called Support Art Workers, which emerged um, as a social media initiative at the beginning of the lockdown, and it's within days it exploded with thousands, thousands of members from musicians, uh, actors, um, dancers and other kind of performing artists who joined together and started sharing views, sharing information and so on um, in this whole, whole space. Um, again, uh, there's an ambiguous connection there between the official trades unions and those grassroots campaigns that, that sometimes they, they collaborate well together, sometimes they might be a little bit antagonistic, but uh, overall what we're finding is an explosion in collectivity are, are along those lines, which we haven't seen uh, and this is one of the results of, of um, the corona pandemic, is that a lot of those performing artists are actually collaborating together and kind of phrasing demands and organizing in, in levels that we haven't uh, seen uh, before. Now, in Greece especially, we're talking about a space where the, um, the arts funding is close to zero. There, there's no um, proper uh, state-funded uh, state kind of support for artists in the, in the way that you might find in other spaces. So that also has contributed to those campaigns becoming a lot more politicized and asking uh, from the state uh, specific kinds of uh, things. Um, so in terms of our, our findings uh, thus far, and obviously the, the project is still ongoing and we're trying to develop some proposals together with those, those artists, um, the, the main things that we are finding up until now is, first of all, the whole, what we call the work of producing, the, the work of, of cancelling events, uh, trying to postpone them, moving them online and so on, is a huge amount of unpaid labour. Um, so even though we might think that artists at the moment are just not working and not getting paid, they're actually working and not getting paid. Um, so they're working in terms of trying to kind of strategize for, for their careers, trying to find alternatives for the events, even if they're moving them online and so on, that is a, a huge amount of labor in itself. Trying to apply for funds, uh, to claim benefits and so on, there's a huge amount of labor involved in these kind of efforts, and this is obviously unpaid and, and to some extent uh, invisible. And the second thing that we're finding is around uh, ideas of self-organizing that I already mentioned. Um, this might be more or less politicized, and this is an interesting difference between Greece and Northern Ireland. In Greece, uh, some of these campaigns have been very public, uh, even including uh, kind of outside demonstrations and so on in front of the parliament. And you, you might have spotted a couple of pictures uh, already here in the PowerPoint. They come from these um, demonstrations. So they're more outright political, while in Northern Ireland they, they have been a little bit more um, um, organized around kind of uh, creating collectives of care of people supporting each other, but in, in a more invisible and more kind of low key uh, way compared to what is happening in, in Athens. Um, so importantly, the main thing that we're finding at the moment is that there is a lot of um, kind of development of networks going on between those artists. And those, are, those networks are usually outside of the official organizations, they're not necessarily detected or acknowledged or taken into account by the states and sponsors, but they're still there. They, they form what we call um, an invisible uh, creative ecology of networks that are there being creative, being uh, collaborative and so on, and starting to develop ideas of what a post-COVID performing industry might or should look like. Because for many of those um, art workers, what we're finding is that obviously this is not the only crisis they've been through. This is a result of a pileup of, of crisis coming from before in terms of austerity and so on. That is the, just the, the last kind of uh, exacerbation of an existing condition of um, inequality, of, of precarity and so on. So they're not only thinking about the short term of how do we recover the industry and going back to um, being able to live out of the art that we're making, but actually how can we see this as a moment where we might question the whole uh, idea of how a performing industry works and, and um, kind of going to the future in more um, equitable, more productive, more creative, more um, equal uh, ways uh, going forward. Uh, so these are the main findings that we have at the moment. Again, um, most of these are generated by the artists and their discussion groups themselves. Uh, we're trying to feed into some of these policy proposals, um, give them some of the um, depth of the research that we've done before and some of the language that uh, might be articulated more in conversation with academia and, and so on. Uh, but essentially what is happening is uh, based on what they um, uh, think themselves. Uh, so that's all I, I, I wanted to, to, to say. These are our 
our Twitter handles uh, if you want to contact us or have any more ideas that you want to share with us. Uh, and I'm going to leave it there for now. So thanks. Thank you, Yanis and Ali as well. It's an amazing research in terms of two very different creative perspectives, but also there's a lot of similarity there between them. I would just encourage people, if you have a question around this particular topic, um, just to note it down on a piece of paper or in the chat function, because the rest of our questions will be held to the panel discussion at the end now. So just use the chat function or just make a note on a piece of paper. That would be great and we'll answer questions at the end. Now to introduce Michelle. Michelle's focus was around children and young people and she was one of the key researchers of the first global survey and look at how COVID was affecting children and young people. And Michelle is research project coordinator in the Center for Children's Rights. So I'll leave it to you, Michelle, to explain um, how your particular research has come about and who you are. Um, thanks, Janine. I think um, Gemma maybe wants to go next. I think Gemma has to leave early. Is that right, Gemma? Would you like to go next? Go ahead, Michelle. You go, unless you're, or do you want to go? I, I mean, we were Happy going. Happy enough. Happy enough, Gemma, if you want to go now. Oh, that would be yeah, Gemma, if you have to go somewhere, go you now. Yeah, fine. Okay, thanks a million. So Gemma is looking at who is described as vulnerable um, in a pandemic and the the unpacking of that and has a phenomenal research group of over 400 people from older learners who are suffering social exclusion during COVID, looking at courses from languages, literature, theology. But that's the not me. That's not me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'll just, sorry, I'm throwing out the whole order. Sorry. Will I just, will you I go ahead? Just, oh, you go, Gemma. Go. <laughs> you, I don't want to, that, that's actually uh, Tess's uh, brilliant project you're describing. Brilliant project. Well, you go for it, you go for it, Gemma, and explain yours. Apologies. Oh, oh. You're muted, Gemma. On mute. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, so uh, I'm really sorry about messing this up. It was just because we're running over time. I better stick to time now, haven't I? And not be more than 10 minutes. So um, this research is um, from the same fund that Kevin described at the start. And I teamed up with uh, Brona Burns, the Centre, who is also in the social policy team here with me in social sciences, and um, Anne-Marie Gray, who is my um, uh, co-investigator in ARC. You might be uh, familiar with ARC and the ARC Aging Programme. And then we took on uh, Stephanie McGuire as a research assistant to this fund, and this is really why we got so much work done. We all work uh, with looking at policies for vulnerable people. And uh, so I work on uh, aging and older people. Uh, Brona works on disability and children's rights and Amory works on youth and social care as well for older people. So we wanted to really look from the early days of the pandemic about who was described as vulnerable, particularly in media and public debate and how this fed into policy. So um, what I'm going to do because the time is so, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to move on to the next slide. Um, because the time is so short, I'm going to use some of the concepts from the book that I've just published in order to kind of take a shape on um, what we're discussing, because anybody who's studied theory will know it's really handy for helping you to process a lot of information at once. And we could see that from uh, David and Neil's talk at the start, that one of the big challenges is trying to make sense of there being so much information and so much noise around the pandemic. So uh, what we did really was decided to focus in on uh, older people in particular, and to look at you know, how age has been used to shape the social policy um, response of government. So one of the things that we've produced is a research update for, this is ARC research update, and ARC is the Northern Ireland Social Policy Hub, and we constantly try to provide evidence for policymakers to make decisions. And that was based on one part of this research, which is um, around the letters that, that older people wrote to newspapers. And I thought it was so interesting that David made the point that that's all moved on to social media now, and it has for the most part, but there still are letters pages and older people still use letters as a way of um, uh, communicating how they feel about certain things. So I'm going to take a couple of seconds to kind of make a key point that I think everybody uh, could take away from this, 
um, my talk, which is that in order to understand how the pandemic has affected different groups, you need to understand the underlying population structure that of the society that you live in. So this is a population pyramid. This is for Western Europe. And as you can see there, we have lots and uh, people up here at the top. It's a very kind of slender pyramid, not really pyramid shaped at all. And that's because we have a low fertility uh, extended life expectancy uh, demographic. Then the next slide shows you um, what the population pyramid looks in Western Africa. And straight away, you can see how there aren't the same number of older people up at the top and there's far more children, which goes some way to explaining why Africa and Western Europe have very different experiences of the pandemic. The next uh, slide I want to, so I'll just kind of take that into account. There's other issues obviously with Africa, but I want you to just bear that in mind when you're talking about how many older people have died of COVID uh, during the pandemic, that's one of the reasons. Then I want you to take a look here at an example um, of uh, Maria Branyas, who has been identified in the media as uh, this kind of heroic example of somebody who has, uh, who has uh, survived coronavirus. And this is a really key point because what's so uh, overwhelming in the media is the idea that if you're older, that you're going to catch, you, you're, if you catch COVID, you're likely to die. Whereas actually many older people, in fact, most older people who get COVID will survive. And this point I really want to make very clear because when we started to do our first initial media analysis, we found that there was this overwhelming, and I'll explain that in more detail in a minute, overwhelming sense that if you were old, that, that was the biggest uh, factor in terms of you dying of COVID. Uh, and we found even from the early days that the public health people like Chris Whitty were trying to intervene in the debate and say, well, actually, no, you're not a goner if you get coronavirus, as it was described in the Daily Mail. And there's some important statistics to bear in mind here that actually, if you looked at the um, life expectancy in, the, in England in 2016, you could see that if you are uh, 75, you could expect to live for another 12 years at least if you're a man and 13 years if you're a woman. So this idea that all those older people who died were going to die anyway, that's actually not at all, um, that's not at all the case. So um, I want to give a quick overview though of the COVID deaths in the UK because I think there's a very strong connection between these kind of statistics and then how we kind of manage to understand what's happened and how that is um, discussed in the media. So. Yes, it's true that 80% of the people who, whose death was recorded as COVID related were aged 75 or over. Uh, but that doesn't actually translate then to 80% of people who are, who 80% um, of older people will die of COVID. And that, that's what's kind of getting confused, confusing in the media. But of the people who did die, a big factor was where you live. So it wasn't just your age, that most of the people who died were people who were in care homes. And this was because of a disastrous decision made by the um, uh, UK government to, when they decided to protect the NHS, they wanted to create more space for um, COVID patients in hospitals. And they moved lots of older people out into care homes, but the care homes were not protected. And this research by Hodgson et al from July this year is based on the first wave. And they found that most of the people who died were people from care homes and also uh, of those 30,500 deaths in care homes, only 10,000 were actually caused by COVID. So um, the question then is what did they die of? And many people died actually of whatever underlying condition they had that they actually needed to be in hospital for. Let's move on to the media analysis. Uh, we did a lot of work, way more work than we planned to do because Stephanie was so fantastic, but also because like the first speaker said, once you start going into the media, you start drowning in data very quickly. But what I'm going to focus on is the second search there, which is around the letters that older people wrote, because most of the discussion in this pandemic about older people has been about them. It hasn't actually ever been um, a sense of giving voice to older people's views. And these letters were often very witty and insightful and were full of um, really great examples of how people were coping. So I'm going to focus on those now. And if you read the research update that I highlighted there in the earlier slides, you can go and read more detail of this. Uh, for all the nerds out there, here's a little bit of the methods that we use. So we didn't just go and read a whole load of newspapers. Uh, what we actually did was we did a framing analysis. So this is something that's used by public health researchers who look at media 
uh, discussions around, say, things like diabetes. This was developed by people who study diabetes. Um, it was a study by Foley, Nocton, and some other researchers. And it's a qualitative media analysis where you look for how the problem is defined. And in our case, the problem was defined as older people are more likely to die of coronavirus than any other section of the population. That was what the media kept reporting. Then a causal attribution is made. It, very quickly, the connection was made that old age equals death if you get COVID. But as I've shown you from the statistics, actually it's about an 8% chance where not an 80% chance, it seems to be um, suggested in the media. And then there was a very interesting kind of intergenerational moral evaluation made where younger people who didn't, who weren't, you know, sticking to the lockdown properly were seen as selfish millennials and that older people then were expected to manage their own risk. And uh, any of you who followed some of that stuff in the Barrington Declaration, that was this idea of, you know, the individual must protect themselves and must stay at home and the generations must be um, separate. So the, there's a whole kind of moral debate that comes in about who's sticking to the rules. In terms of the kind of intervention that was, the intervention was the lockdown, but the outcome of that or the kind of treatment for this is that actually thousands of older people do end up staying at home. And the first, um, the first presentation really showed that, how we all started to stay at home. Um, and I really thought we, I was gonna find in these letters that these older people were fearful and terrified of the virus, but the people of the 46 letters that were published, actually what we found was the opposite we found that older people were really keen to, to assess their own risk and to manage their own risk. And all the letters were around, whether you were on the right of the spectrum or the left of the spectrum, there was a very strong kind of liberal argument for freedom, that I'm missing my freedom. freedom. The government should trust me to make my own decisions, that actually isolation is taking away all my reasons for living. I think we can all empathize with that one. Uh, and that older people, so uh, the Express, a newspaper that is particularly um, kind of aimed at older readers, said that the government is treating us all like second class citizens. So I'm going to focus now on that second um, one there from The Guardian, because there was a whole series of letters that were kind of a conversation that was going on. And they were set off by a letter from Sally Vickers, which was around this idea of uh, wanting to manage your own risk. Don't let older people's freedom be stolen during this crisis. So, um, okay. so as I said, older people wanted to be trusted to manage their own risk. Uh, so I'm going to read this quote and then give you a little bit of tiny analysis on it. May I express solidarity with Sally Vickers? The idiocy of this random cutoff is even more evident if expressed as year of birth. The random cutoff she's talking about is the idea that everybody over 70 is expected to shield. Uh, and if you look at year of birth, it's even more nonsensical rather than age, she says. Let's compare a non-smoker and moderate drinker born November 1947 with an officially approved body mass index, a career record of useful contribution to society, who's doing pro bono work that's currently frozen, to an overweight individual born June 1964, who's never done a day's useful work in his life and has been demonstrably reckless with his own health and that of others. Now let's decide which is the better bet for early release. So this was Sally Phillips writing to The Guardian. Anybody who uh, is an alert listener can tell that who she's talking about there is Boris Johnson. And this brought up this really interesting kind of uh, nuance to this idea of older people are at risk. In fact, most older people are going to be fine, even if they get coronavirus, they're going to survive. But at a population level, if you think back to the pyramids I showed you at the start, yes, you can see how an older population has higher risks. Now there's a point here made by a, a retired um, social worker, and that comes back to the point I made earlier about the, the government's idea of protecting the NHS. Um, and he talks about his complete, you know, feeling of powerlessness and deep regret um, that for years and years he had been trying to convince a government to find money to move people who were described often um, very unfairly as bed blockers. So very often there's older people who are in hospital and they actually could go and live um, elsewhere if there was decent social care, but social care hasn't been properly um, funded or provided um, ever in this country. So um, he said it finally happened, right? So for years and years, he spent his whole career trying to argue that older people should be um, moved to social care when it is appropriate. He said, come COVID-19, everything changes. Funding becomes instantly available. Everyone possible must be discharged as quickly as possible with or without being tested for COVID-19 and the results known. Care homes are the obvious instant solution. So what happens? Discharged older people infect inadequately protected care home staff and existing residents. Both die. 
And apart from care home residents, another group that really was affected by um, the high, higher number of deaths were, were care home people, social care workers. Was this not foreseeable? Did it not matter? Indeed, might it have been a policy consequence of a government interested only in avoiding NHS political embarrassment? And my analysis and conclusion is that we needed to have social scientists in there from the start. I am um, up until recently a member of the executive committee of the British Society of Gerontology, and we wrote a paper in March 2020, a statement saying this, that, you know, this kind of blanket idea of chronological age it really isn't right. There's massive diversity within the older population. And I think if we had listened to people like that social worker at the start, we would have avoided many of the excess deaths and the UK would now not be leading in terms of having over 50,000 deaths from the pandemic. It also, I think, throws up some really interesting um, struggles that we have as a society to reconcile ourselves with old age. You know, we assume that being older means you're vulnerable. Oh, but then in another way, if you think the two presidential candidates in the recent American election were 74 and 78, so is age just a number? So we're very, very conflicted about age. But I think in terms of the contribution that our little project makes is in terms of really trying to draw out how the public messaging around protect the NHS left older people in nursing homes actually in the firing line of the virus and how, you know, very simplistic three point plans like this government are, are so keen on are actually can be really, really harmful. And that but what the pandemic has shown is that social care needs to be adequately funded and to be integrated in the NHS. It is part of the problem and it can be part of the solution. So that's my um, presentation over. Thank you, Gemma. That's, that's fascinating. And it is really interesting because it harks back to, to what Yanis was talking about as well in terms of nothing about us without us. If people had been listened to, you know, and social research embedded from the very beginning in terms of that listening process and the social yeah, science. Yeah, one, one of the things I want to do is develop this paper. We're going to publish a paper is to really analyse, you know, the, the, the makeup of the SAGE committee because there's very little kind of, of the social science, social gerontology, you know, that kind of older people's voice really isn't there. Uh, and we did try hard, the British Society of Gerontology, we really tried to get into the debate and basically, uh, you know, it was too focused on health. And, and I, I would say in hindsight, with the whole pandemic, we'll all look back and go, we were too under the clot of a particular view, you know, a very medically focused approach to dealing with the pandemic. And, I'm sure the mental health studies and you know the Michelle study and things will show that. Yes, and, and also putting older people into a very single identity voice, you know, and stereotype and put it, you, mm -hmm. you know, whereas there's much a wider nuance within, you know, a person's aging and whether they age well and how they you're age. You're the same well. person, your number is just bigger, you know, and yeah. diversity within that population is much, much. I think that is one thing we learn, you know, is that there is much more diversity within that population. If you took any other section of the population, if you took people, you know, from the age of 45 to 60, you wouldn't expect them to be all the same. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Gemma. We're going to move to you, Michelle, now. And without further ado, because I've introduced you and you can go for it. I'll go straight in, yeah, and it's, it's really interesting, um, you know, what Gemma is saying about older people, because obviously working with children, we have the exact same thing, you know, they're a very diverse group in age, it's just an arbitrary number, I've met some very bright young people and some very dim adults, you know, so their competency is questioned a lot, and that's what I, I want to share with you today, our methodology from our centre and how we include uh, children and young people in our research. So my name is Michelle Templeton. I'm presenting on behalf of our centre staff. We're um, a big interdisciplinary centre in the university and we all work together to each other's strengths. And that's why I think we're, we're so strong and so internationally recognised. So we got involved in this COVID under uh, 19 um, an initiative, which given that we are an international centre, we have lots of links with global partners all around the world. So lots of children's rights experts, lots of NGOs and advocacy organisations there. You can see this is just some of them. I think there's about 
there's about 30 organisations involved at the minute. Some big ones there, you can see like World Vision, Tarta Homes, we have United Nations Special Rapporteurs in there as well, um, you know, pushing the initiative and informing the initiative. Um, I'm going to go through this really quickly because I know we only have uh, 10 minutes. So I want to talk a, a bit Phil, about... sorry, we can see your presentation. You can't see it? No, um, if you want to hit share, share the screen, maybe it hasn't come up for you. I have, yeah, hold on, I'll hit it again, I'll hit it again. Is that it now? Perfect. Is that it? Right, okay, great. You see, I'm working with two screens here, so sometimes I, I hit the wrong one. Is oh, that yeah. it? The zoom. Oh, there's it there. Is that it? Right, great. Okay, Um. yeah, so... I'll flick on to where I was, the partners. So this is a slide here, just some of the partners that are involved. And you can see that there's a lot of some high level um, influence that are involved in the project. So I just want to tell you a wee bit about our children's rights based methods and how we involve children in our research. We would never develop a research project without including the target population, because what do we know about their experiences? You know, they're the ones that need to inform us and we can facilitate their voices in, in the work to get more relevant information and more contextually relevant information, I think. So our method has been developed by uh, the Lundy model, Professor L uh, Laura Lundy, who's the director of the centre. And that model really um, uses children as co-researchers in our projects. So whilst we would be developing our teams and our expertise, we would always have children as well as experts on being children and young people to tell us what the context is like for them today. Um, so in terms of our uh, researchers, co-researchers that we had in this global project, we had over 100 children and young people as advisors on the project. Um, now some float in and out at different times, depending on the different needs of the projects. But basically at the start, um, you can see here, when we were doing our global co consultation, we spoke with 270 children from 28 countries, all aged around 18 to 17. And, and we had a task for them um, around, you know, tell us what, what you would like us to ask children. What would you like to find out? What are the most important issues for you during this COVID and during lockdown? So we got those re responses back. Um, we, we would all, always respond back to our children and young people's suggestions as well as to, you know, the, the information that we have taken from them and that, that we can use and some information as to what, why we could not use that, which are usually around ethical issues um, that we could not include in our surveys and in our research or usually methodological issues. But importantly, we would feed back to our groups and our partners who would facilitate these focus groups and consultations all around the world with different types of children. Um, and the information that we cannot put into our surveys and our research, we would always feed that back to the facilitators of those groups because then, you know, we would be able to tell them. So here's some information that your children and young people are really interested in. We can't take it forward because it's beyond the scope of our study at the minute, but this might be something that you might want to work with the children on as well, so that the children's views aren't being lost um, completely because they're very important views. Our survey then, we were developing a survey. So all that information fed into the survey. Obviously all our partner organizations had information that they wanted to gather as well uh, to help their advocacy works in children's rights around the world. So our focus was on the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. And what we did was we kind of structured our survey in terms of the children's rights um, and the articles around the, the convention. And what we wanted to do was capture change during the lockdown. So what has changed? You know, what is, you know, better now, worse off now, same as during COVID. So we developed those kind of skills. Um, so in terms of education, you know, are you able to access the education that you need? You know, it's better now, same as or worse off. And that's the kind of thing we were trying to capture change in children's rights and how they were being implemented during the lockdown. We also asked um, open qualitative questions around what advice would children give to their governments? And that's really important because we can then, in terms of disaggregating our data, we can disaggregate by countries. Um, and by regions, um, um, we can feed back that information. But really importantly for us in terms of having a global survey and working with our global partners, 
is that we can segregate our data by groups. So we, 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 we do ask in our questionnaires about types of groups that children would identify as, you know, in particular LGBT, um, children in a, in a car detention situation, in a migrant or refugee situation. Because we work with our global partners, we can access those children so we can get great information on those contexts as well. So our online survey received over 26,000 responses, which is really great. All the children were aged between 8 and 17 years of age and that's really important because um, we do like to work with younger children as well. Younger children are very insightful um, and they're very opinionated once given the opportunity, as is everyone, you know, once given the opportunity to speak everyone has an opinion. But what we did with our survey was we routed some questions so obviously 8 to 11 year olds got far less questions than those sort of you know between 13 16 and, and 17 years of age the questions were, were, were routed so some questions will not have responses for children under 17 or under 13. 27 languages um well, so this kind of took on a, a life of its own this this survey um and lot, lots of partners and friends from all, all around the world came in to help us translate the um survey into 27 different languages we also have an easy read version that was available as well and that was developed with children who may have um, learning difficulties or may not be able to read or, or write and, and, and have trouble with that. So an easy read version is, was available as well. And that's very important for us in the Centre for Children's Rights. So just really to fly through sort of what, what we did and what we've done so far and where we're at with the data, we have produced the thematic brief. We, we have a lot of data. We have 27,000 responses to over 35, 36 questions. Um, some of those questions have multiple responses and so four or five of those questions are qualitative questions in 27 different languages. So we have lots of information to get through and we're still um, I'm scratching my head and thinking about it. We're still trawling our way through all, all that data. It's amazing stuff we have um, and we can cut it lots of different ways. To date, we have, we've developed a few, uh, nine thematic briefings. So this is really areas of interests of staff in our centre who have been able to take something that they're interested in and, you know, go through the numbers, go through the groupings, go through all the demographics. And we've came up with these thematic briefings. We're having a big um, official United Nations launch at the start of December. So we're trying to get these nine thematic briefings shaped up for that. And then there'll be lots more information and country specific information that will come out um, after that, that launch. So you can see we have briefings on poverty, LGBT children, experiences of COVID, that, that's a health kind of one about numbers, who had it, who didn't, about prevention and protection, that kind of thing. Um, you know, and we have briefings around education, play, safety and violence, um, which are really big pertinent themes for adults and also for the children. So it's important to note that when working with our children, we're asking them to rank what they think is important as well and the top three for the children and young people that has came out was um, education, safety and violence and then poverty. So they're the top three that I think we're all kind of interested in. So just to turn to show you then how we included children in the interpretation of the data, which is very important for us as well. And their information, as it says here, will also be included in the final results. So it's adult and children's interpretations to give us our overall findings in the thematic briefings. And that's really important. So again, online, international groups. So we have children from all around the world. Um, you know, we have challenges with time zones and languages and translators and whatever, um, but we're trying our best and we have lots of in-kind help and translation uh, available. Um, so we're, we're, we're doing our best with that. Again, it's really challenging. But the same, um, you know, we find that the children come back time and time again. They're having these online workshops almost weekly and they're not just around research, they're around safety online, they're around communications, advocacy work, um, you know, they're around uh, areas of interest that experts are coming on and chatting with them and keeping them really engaged and really building their capacity to be involved in the project, which is so important. So in terms of our quantitative data, we have had lovely workshops online with the children and young people. Um, so some people think, you know, oh, children can't be involved in that kind of thing. So what we did was we broke the information in our survey uh, down into um, two kind of tables. So table A was about all the demographic information. 
Table B then um, was the substantive sort of rights and the sets of questions on education, on online, on health, on protection, on well-being, all, all those questions. And what we did was um, after a few, you know, prep workshops and sort of we, we had our quantity of experts there, obviously, to chat it through and ask questions and could this be possible? We kind of came up with this notion here of turning the data into useful information. So how can we do that? We got them to think of areas of interests. I mean, so bearing in mind, some of these children and young people may work for children's rights organizations, um, like in Indonesia and Paraguay, and they may have interests around protection and safety or access to education, things like that. Um, so think about their interests, think about things that they want to find out if they're positives or negatives, and also to think about challenges and opportunities that might come from the data and um, that could help with our advocacy work. So we, we asked them to make relationships between the table, table A and table B, and to give us lines into things that they may be interested in and cross kind of cross relationships. So that's how they, they came up with their interesting information that they wanted to know more about in the quantitative data and then our team would go run all that information bring it back to them would think what was significant and what wasn't what was important to report and what wasn't so that was done very well um, and again feeds into our thematic briefings in terms of the qualitative data we held some on online workshops here are the qualitative questions we asked the children were provided with um, an example from some quotes from the education, the poverty and the safety um, aspects of the, 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 the qualitative questions. And they were given um, online workshops on how to cluster and how to code and why we group things together and why there is no right and no wrong and people's it's subjective and all that kind of thing. Um, I think we had two or three workshops around coding with sweets and chocolates and pizzas and lot, lot, lots of different things people were using. And they were very uh, interactive and very uh, informative workshops. So what we have came up with are um, themes and relationships in the data that are of interest to children which we are at the minute now populating into the thematic briefings that the adults have al already compiled so that information is getting fed in there and it will be made clear that you know analyzing the the, the data the children find and you know their relationships and their themes will, will, will be definitely stated and highlighted there. So basically a, that was just a quick run through of a very big and online and difficult piece of work in 28 languages. Um, but to conclude what we have here is we have captured a, a, you know, a chunk of children across the world. Obviously it's not representative for any country because there wouldn't be enough children there, you know, but we have captured a, a great deal of information around change during lockdown that's happening around the world. And also, um, you know, honed our methodologies around involving children in research online, which can be done really well, really safely and ethically. We have a lot of advice here to governments all around the world on how to uphold children's rights and what children think is important. Um, we, we have lots of information here too on how to respond to relief efforts as well for, for this and future emergency crisis, um, which is really important to our partner organisations who would work on the ground, maybe with refugee children and in disaster zones, etc. Um, but more importantly, I think what we have found is that our lockdown situation has given us a lot of information that we can help with children in a sort of a normal situation. Um, I'm referring to, you know, children who'd be in refugee camps or in detention centres and how we can really engage um, but better with them. Um, so a quick a quick world through. Thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Michelle. I've put in the chat um, if people can basically pop questions there for the panel discussion at the end. And we'll segue quickly to Tess and Carolyn around open learning and older learners. I'll leave you two to basically explain your research scope and then we'll have in 10 minutes time a panel discussion. Thank you, Tess Super. and Carolyn. Thank you, Janine. Uh, You're muted, Carolyn. There we go. Uh, is Tess there? I don't see her, so just continue on, and if she comes in, we'll let her in. All right, okay. Um, okay, super. Uh, so uh, this is our, our open learning impact evaluation of online prototypes. Um, and uh, Tess uh, really pioneered this project, and uh, 
was was certainly intending to do the first five slides, um, but um, we'll we'll carry on regardless anyway. Uh, Tess, uh, as I'm sure as, as many of you know, um, is exceptionally um, uh, how would you put it diligent in regards to um, her advocating of um, the involvement of adult learners and uh, obviously uh, midst the oh, this isn't moving on for some reason. Sorry, two seconds. Um, the uh, like at the start of the the COVID crisis had uh, the the mindset that uh, obviously the adult learners and uh, and open learning uh, needed some kind of um, way of uh, of um, access and learning during this time where, uh, as we've already heard today in the sessions, that um, that they're facing particular isolation. Sorry, my my slides are stuck for some reason or another. Just give me two seconds. Um, so uh, so obviously we, we decided to uh, develop a small scale action research project to offer uh, free taster courses to to learners and to older people more generally. So it was it was going uh, above and beyond uh, the database and open learning and trying to engage uh, more older learners as well as part of the project. Um, so evidently it was, it was funded by ESRC and we're very grateful uh, for that too. And uh, Artage and um, U3A um, were, uh, did I hear Tess do it? No? I thought I heard somebody chipping in there. I thought it was maybe the Tess coming here to, uh, to do these slides. Is that- Hello. Hello Tess, wonderful to see you there. It was, uh, Sorry, uh, I, didn't, I didn't know you were there. Go, yeah, go. I'm, I've been here, I've been here for hours. <laughs> <Have you? laughs> apologies, apologies. Uh, fire you away that so, Tess. Uh, it, it was just to let uh, the host know that the, they need to um, let me in, as it were. Uh, they've let me in on the, on the sound, but I don't know if you can see me. Not, you know, it doesn't matter whether they can see just so um, that uh, what what are you coming up as we can't see your name you see uh two zero zero eight seven 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 okay thank you yes apologies um tess you seem to have come up as a number rather than a name there don't worry yes <laughs> I think I jinx, I, I put a jinx, you know, things break down as soon as they, um, as soon as I go near them. That's you now, Tess, we can see you. So can you pick up then, or Carolyn, can you continue? No, super, I'm, I'm more than happy to let, let Tess uh, carry on there. Thanks. Okay, folks, well, thank you. Uh, first of all, thanks to everybody uh, it's been a very interesting session and thank you for the chance uh, to be part of this. It's really, I feel very honoured. Uh, so, uh, uh, um, uh, as Carolyn was saying, um, really, like like um, uh, uh, Gemma, we're, we're, because a lot of our learners are older people, we're, we're quite focused uh, on that cohort. And, 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 you know, again, kind of echoing what, what Gemma has said, a lot of older people, uh, you know, were expressing feelings of social isolation. So we weren't able to run a, an open learning program uh, in the autumn and indeed over the, had to kind of stagger the finish of our spring program. So really this was our response to, to thinking how we could do something to actually keep uh, contact and, and tackle that social isolation with our learners. So that was really, uh, you know, how we got started with the whole thing. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was a challenge because uh, a lot of us, myself particularly, uh, was really a bit of a class dunce in terms of all this um, kind of open learning, uh, op online learning stuff. So it, it was, um, you know, it really was a, a challenge, but what we were very keen to think about was uh, how we would involve our own learners. And that was based really and built on research, action research that I had done for, for years and years. 
So I think that's probably, I don't want to delay any further because I know time is very precious for everybody. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to my estimable colleague, Carla, now um, uh, to talk a little bit about the, the methodology in a second. But you can just see uh, here that we had, uh, in response to an open call, we had six tutors who uh, very kindly agreed uh, to have a go at this. And you can see uh, the range of stuff that people were proposing, quite a good range. So. Uh, I think we can go on now, really, uh, to the methodology, if that's okay, Carolyn. Super, super. That's grand. Thanks, Tess. Um, and as Tess has said, we um, obviously had the, the six online prototypes, and uh, the tutors worked exceptionally hard to develop and design these uh, prototypes. Tess obviously included um, in the, the tutors there as well, and she... Um, took up the uh, technological mantle and was able to uh, produce her own uh, prototype with skill and ease. Um, so they were, they were very well received and there was uh, over 400 uh, participants who engaged with the online learning, which we're exceptionally pleased with. Um, but in, in regards to your approach, we had a mixed methodological approach and it was an online cross-sectional survey and also a focus group um, with the tutors uh, as well. Um, and uh, our sampling, as I said, we had over 400 participants and 65 of the participants evaluated the online prototypes and six, all six uh, tutors participated in the focus group. And obviously, as I'm sure you would know that um, the ethical approval was obtained by our ethics committee. And, um, and then when it comes to the quality of findings, these are just simply some descriptive statistics in regards to um, what we were trying to capture. We had a whole array of questions in the online survey and, uh, and just quite simply in regards to the age, 8.5% uh, of those who participated were in the over, 40, uh, uh, over 55 category. Um, and there was 13 who didn't disclose their age. Uh, but we can gather from those who completed the online evaluation that most of uh, those who participated were older learners. Uh, and in regards to the courses, they were uh, relatively well divided in regards to creative writing and Tess's uh, prototype and on kidnapped. And then we had a couple of language ones from Barbara Bo Boyle and uh, Federica uh, Ferrari as well, and um, one on Italian, one on Ger German, and then uh, a theological one as well from Colin. Um, and in regards to enjoyment, we were, were very uh, glad that uh, the majority, the large majority of uh, participants enjoyed the, the course. Um, and, and also when it came to the, the quality of findings and um, uh, poster focus group, we were able to um, uh, obviously uh, assert that the tutors very much enjoyed the process as well, uh, which was really interesting in regards to the whole aspect of peer learning, which we'll get on to in a moment or two. And, uh, and given what Tess was speaking about there a moment or two ago in regards to social isolation, that uh, the majority of those who completed the, um, the evaluation um, stated that it would be an excellent way um, to, to really help with feelings of isolation and loneliness um, during lockdown and, uh, and obviously during this period of, of restrictions as well. So our quality of findings, we um, obviously had um, five different themes there uh, and we, we categorise them there um, as theme one, student and tutor experiences of the advantages of online learning. So as part of the survey, we had a, a quality of uh, section there for any other comments that any of the students would uh, like to, to give that they didn't feel was, was captured in the, the, the quantitative questions. Um, so uh, we, we triangulated these together and came up with, uh, as I say, five themes. Um, so the students, um, they, they very much enjoyed, uh, well, they appeared to very much enjoy, and we assumed that they did, they did uh, enjoy the, the online prototypes. And uh, there was a variety of different uh, comments like this one here, and they took the, the course subject, um, uh, they took a simple subject and delivered it in a clear, practical and amusing way. And there's a, a tutor. And again, this was something that was resonating amongst all the tutors that uh, it was an enjoyable experience and it was inspirational for many. And uh, this whole aspect of 
uh, peer support and peer learning was coming out consistently. So theme two, student and tutor experiences of the disadvantages of online learning. And uh, needless to say, there was a few, but they were in the minority who um, stated that, uh, that this approach the, it didn't particularly appeal to them. Um, but uh, the majority were very constructive in regards to their comments um, about the, the disadvantages or what they saw as the disadvantages, including some interactive elements would be great, um, but obviously there was an awareness that this uh, introduces further levels of complexity. Um, and this is something that, that obviously has been discussed within uh, open learning and uh, is likely to be integrated into the online uh, course or courses going forward. Um, online teaching is a tutor saying as well, just resonating the students' comments that, that uh, again, this, uh, this sense of feedback is also important for the tutors and especially in the language courses that this was something that um, the language tutors really flagged up that they would like more feedback. Um, th theme three, student and tutor preference regarding online learning. And, um, this uh, student, I think, uh, very articulately um, commented that uh, as a person with severe mobility and other health problems, I'm not always able to attend classes. So this sort of presentation would potentially address that problem uh, for people like me and bridge that gap. In essence, what I'm suggesting is that in further pursuance of its inclusion and equality policies, the university sh should consider um, these uh, online, I just can't see the last week comment there because of the, uh, the bar at the side, but uh, online learning for the differently abled market. Um, and uh, this was, was certainly something that we, we obviously um, included in our recommendations and pointed towards that uh, this could potentially be uh, the way forward for open learning. Um, and uh, uh, irrespective of uh, vaccination and everything returning uh, back to what we uh, knew as normal. Um, so it has been certainly a very helpful process. And there the, the tutors uh, also commenting that uh, although the technical elements were formidable at the outset, I'm now an advocate of this format. Um, so there was, there was quite a, a, a lot of discussion around blended learning as well, um, which may potentially be a way forward for open learning uh, in the days ahead. So theme four, student and tutor experiences with technology training and presentation issues. And there was, there was a few glitches in regards to the technology as we experience in most of these Zoom meetings and uh, Teams meetings, et cetera, there's always the odd glitch. Um, but uh, the student was just saying just simple issues like uh, font sizes, et cetera. And, um, and then when it comes to the tutors, that uh, again, this issue of uh, peer support um, was, uh, was really helpful for the tutors. Um, the student, uh, theme five, the student and tutor experiences of online learning as a response to the COVID-19 restrictions. Um, so uh, what the, tutor, the tutors and the students were saying collectively that this potentially has, um, Obviously, uh, um, uh, well, uh, this this course, uh, these courses have potential for wider application, and as one student said as well, that uh, has potential for global application, and um, they because they were so well received, and uh, and from the the tutor's perspective, there was definite evidence of uh, a sense of creativity and innovation, and um, being able to to create something new. Um, was very much appreciated and, uh, and by the tutors who are all um, doing this voluntarily as well, much as they were provided with technical uh, training that they, they did take their own time uh, to um, uh, create their prototypes. So the conclusions in this uh, it proved very successful in uh, engaging 400 adult learners and 65 of whom provided an evaluation and this was only in a short space of two months. Um, and we, we know as well through the evaluation that the, the Open Learning Pilot um, uh, succeeded in achieving its primary objective of decreasing isolation. This is one of the, the key questions in our survey as well. Um, and also um, we, as I've mentioned there before, that um, we found that the online learning is suited to adult learners um, and it also improves tutors' capacity to be innovative and creative in their teaching methods. And the pilot has proved as well that the asynchronous, which is pre-recorded online learning, is a flexible medium and 
um, in the sense that, that through asynchronous learning, um, the learner can learn through repetition. It's also flexible in the sense that they choose the time and the date um, when they want to, to engage with the, the prototype. Um, as well, we concluded that uh, the open line and per, uh, pilot has proved that online learning suits a variety of learning styles and has the potential to enable inclusivity and meet the students with different learning requirements. And also, as which is, is this part is very important to, to test and, and always has been in uh, open learning that the, uh, the adult learners were successfully recruited as co-researchers in the programme and this just um, puts another stamp on the student-centred approach that, uh, that Tess and, and her team advocate for um, in the sense that they were integrally involved in the evaluation of these online prototypes which uh, will shape the trajectory of, of future pathways for QB online learning or open learning. Um, and the impact of this research resonates with existing educational uh, gerontology and um, innovative online uh, pedagogies, which is particularly relevant given the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, which also proves that uh, the cultural congruence of online learning for adult learners in Northern Ireland. The key recommendations we had mentioned before about uh, open learning should consider how global impact could be achieved and again continue to keep adult learners involved as co-researchers co and also how we could enhance peer support for tutors and open learning and also whether uh, it might be an idea to consider further initiatives in te technological training. Um, open learning should also could consider the expanding portfolio or expanding their portfolio of learning opportunities by including synchronous online learning. So, um, in other words, that sense of live and more interactive online learning may appeal to a, a wider group, um, and also uh, it may help to further reduce social isolation through the sense of improved relationships and social interaction and communication. Um, Open learning, the Open Learning Programme should also consider um, how they could create the possibility of the adult learners conversing independently with tutors and again enhancing this relational aspect of online learning. Uh, and finally, um, the Open Learning Programme should cultivate further opportunities to widen participation through target and marketing and providing uh, different levels of courses for adult learners and of different abilities. I'm going to pass over to, to Tess now for uh, the acknowledgements and, uh, and just uh, from my perspective is just doing a small piece of research and, uh, on open QB, open learning. Um, Tess has been uh, tremendously inspiring and encouraging and uh, it's been a, a pleasure working with her. Well, thank you very much, Carolyn. Um, now, I, I would like to, to thank uh, uh, really uh, first of all, the adult learners who took the time to, to participate. Uh, we we'll want to thank uh, ESRC um, and uh, particularly Alice Neeson, who just was such a help uh, in, in kind of helping us through, uh, guiding us through and took a lot of time and, and was very patient with us. Um, and, and as I think somebody else said, it's amazing what she can do with a small amount of money. Um, and I think, you know, maybe Carolyn and myself, country, country girls are, are maybe no bad hand at making a pound last a bit. Uh, but in any case, I want to thank uh, the, the tutors and I want to thank uh, 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 everybody involved in this festival because uh, that allows us to disseminate, which is very, very important in terms of research. And who knows, may actually... Um, sponsor further types of collaborations and partnerships and and so uh, finally i also want to thank um uh, dr ferrari who acted as project coordinator absolutely brilliant uh, and indeed uh, uh, dr carolyn blair whose dedication to this evaluation has been second to none and i'm sure she couldn't have seen me uh, uh, because <laughs> like a this evaluation needs to go through various iterations and that is a key principle of everything that, that we've done in open learning that we have a proper evidence base so I, I just really want to thank her very warmly for all the 
good humored and good hearted work that she has put into this. Um, and uh, just without further uh, ado, thank you all also folks, colleagues uh, for listening. Thank you, Tess and Carolyn. We've come to the end. Um, I noticed that there was a question there from our audience around access to research and findings and things like that, particularly the children's one, but Michelle's answered that. If any of our other presenters today have links or research um, information that they can put in the chat, um, if you could do so now, that would be great so that people can kind of um, flag that and tap on the links and star it for further information. As well, just a reminder, everybody, that um, it's been recorded and it will be up on the QUB YouTube channel for you to go back over if you want to pick up any further pieces of information. And to just thank you all for attending and to finish off with a bit of um, joviality, I've put into the, um, the chat there, uh, just a bit of fun for us as we leave. Um, you'll see who is behind the mask. There's a little bit of a competition there. It's a shame we can't find out how you've gone, but we've run out of time. But it's there. Have a, have a lovely day, everybody. And um, thank you for attending. And thank you to each and every one of the presenters for taking the time today.